I use the word liminal space. Um, I, I've used that word to describe that that kind of place where I like to photograph. Like I like the boundaries, but along the boundary itself is it exists something that's a little more liminal. There's the inside the boundary and outside of the boundary. And you know, you're either in, let's say, for example, you're in the park or you're not, you know. Um, but right along that edge is a place that's a little bit uncertain. Um, and so I kind of think of this project as being there. Welcome to the show, Marion. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we uh, we tried to do this once before, and uh, we were not able to do it. <laughs> but <laughs> I am glad we get another chance at this because uh, uh, your work is uh, is is quite amazing, and so I'm I'm really excited uh, that we get you on the show. Uh, so, for the audience that doesn't know you, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself uh, to the audience. Okay. So I'm a photographer who lives in um, the United States outside of the city of New Haven, which is not far from New York City. Um, I live um, in a place that was primarily um, historically agricultural and now a little more suburban, but it's not far from the sea and I like that. Um, I went to uh, school at Alfred University in New York, the College of Ceramics, and studied to be a ceramicist. Uh, but towards the end of, of my undergrad, I discovered photography um, and ended up going to graduate school at Yale for uh, my MFA in photography. And uh, so that, you know, that was quite a while ago. I've been photographing since. <laughs> uh, and um, my, you know, I've, I've done different series, um, but most of them pertain to the earth in some yeah. manner. And, um, you know, whether it's like, I guess, uh, the I photographed the edges of the North American tectonic plate and uh, the San Andreas Fault in California and the Mid-Atlantic Rift in Iceland. I photographed the Everglades boundary, like the park itself and outside of the boundaries where it's um, been kind of um, developed and Everglades were drained. And, um, and then during the pandemic, I started photographing around my home um, in the in the woods. So, um, and I really love books. I've, I've made um, a few photo book books. And um, I, I just love the fact that the book is democratic. You know, it's affordable or free if you go to the library. Um, it has a, you know, a body of work um, versus like a, an exhibition, you know, it's up for a month. And if you miss it, you miss it. It's just kind of ephemeral in that way. So well, I guess that's a quick uh intro. I think that's a great one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm always curious about, you know, a lot of times work, uh, getting into art and stuff doesn't come out of a vacuum. And so um, I like to kind of understand a little bit about where you came from before you were an artist. So like, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about Marianne before um, you were a photographer, before you got into mm -hmm. art, and how did you kind of find your way into it? Yeah, that's a good question, um, because I think those early experiences really, I mean, to me, um, they, they still shape, you know, what I, I make today. So I grew up um, in kind of a, a factory valley. Um, at the time, the factories were still there. They've left, gone overseas, I guess. And, um, but it was, it was quite... Um, quite mangy and dirty, you know, even toxic. Um, we had a chemical, Uniroyal Chemical Company. We had um, rubber, you know, they made sneakers and tires. 
Um, Naugahyde was um, invented in my town of Naugatuck. <laughs> and so um, my grandfather, we lived in my grandfather's house, which was an enormous 26 room multi-generation household. And um, my father, my grandfather was the a vice president of uh, Scoville Brass Manufacturing. So, you know, they made brass um, a long time ago. They used to make view cameras, Scoville view cameras. Um, so there were lots of different manufacturing, you know, companies along this, this valley, along the Nogtuck River, which was 40 miles long. Nagahide, though. You said something about Nagahide. Is that yeah, a, Nagahide. Is it it's, named after my town, Nagatuck? And it was. It's like a synthetic material. Yeah, synthetic rubber. Interesting. Like oh. or synthetic leather, maybe. Um, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Or gotcha. some something in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just mother. never heard that phrase before. Um, yes. uh, but uh, yeah, continue. You were you were you were talking about uh, how uh, you had a lot of industry in your town, and that that was yes. interesting. And, and so, like when, um, literally, I kid you not, I'd wake up in the morning, and you really felt it when you went outside the house. But um, often, it, the air was so like pointed toxic kind of that it would make my my nostrils kind of sting and my eyes tear i mean it was really and so i'd say oh it's a terrible day today because of the air and then other days you know it would be more clear um but the air would stink you know it was not it was i mean i i from a very young age i was very aware of the environment um because I lived in this place that wasn't clean. It was before the Clean Air Act, be, uh, before the Clean Water Act. And, um, you know, it was just like free range for the, for the manufacturers. And then I was also very aware, I mean, Connecticut, my town, I mean, my state is like one of these, you know, original New England um, places that, have a reputation of being very bucolic, you know, the green, the, how, the church on the green, the rolling hills, um, the, you know, the streams, the clean streams. And that, that was also very much a part of my experience. If I would ride my bike just a couple miles outside of the valley where I lived, I would enter into that other landscape, um, which was really beautiful and pristine. So, you know, I was like, as a young child, how do I kind of reconcile these two, these two experiences of the land and in the air? And so, um, you know, I knew that it was related from a very young age to economics um, and politics. And um, so I kind of grew up with that. But it's funny, I didn't really even realize until not even that long ago, like how much an impression that growing up in that kind of situation made upon me. Um, but another thing that I wanted to say about that, um, in this big house, when I was living there, um, the third floor was empty. And the third floor we had like, there was one room that had a big pool table in it from when my aunts and uncles were growing up in the house. There was one room that we called the bat room. And I really, truly, we had bats that would come and fly down the house. And then there were some other empty rooms. And I took one of those empty rooms for my studio when I was about eight years old. And um, so from a very young age, I had my own studio. Um, I wasn't exposed to museums so much, but we did have a lot of publications that would come to the house, like National Geographic, Life Magazine, The New Yorker, um, you know, The New York Times, where I would look at all of the, the pictures. And we had, um, you know, the Metropolitan um, forgot what it was called, but it, it, you know, each issue was about art, like an impressionism, you know. And so I, I learned, I entered art through that way. Um, 
And, and I just always kind of, you know, had my room where I would make my art. Make so, things. Yeah. yeah. And you got into ceramics at first. What, what kind of pulled you? I did. Um, when what, what I pulled you went that to way? high school, um, I kind of lived in the ceramic studio. I loved it. And it was a real refuge for me. Um, you know, it was, I had kind of a complicated upbringing. You know, my mom was ill. And so, you know, like going to that room and they would just kind of let me go there and work. So, so I just really thought that I would study ceramics. Um, but it's, I think it's of note that my, the money I made for my first job at Carvel, an ice cream shop, um, I saved that money up and bought an Olympus camera when I was in high school. Um, but I had no training in it. I mean, I would photograph like flowers and stuff. Um, but I didn't think that that would be a career path until much later on. Would you get your MFA in? That was photo. Photo. So you yes. did photography with this. Yeah. That's yep. awesome. Yeah. And, and so I, was I, it, was it I went, there that you kind of connected the dots? No, no. It was really undergrad. By the time I graduated undergrad, I was more of a photographer. And then I lived in the city of New Orleans um, for about eight years. And I worked for a commercial photographer, um, Jackson Hill, at Southern Light Studio. And um, and it was an incredible place. We had, you know, a dark room and a beautiful studio. And Jackson taught me so much. You know, I ended up doing all of his dark room work and would assist him. Um, I learned so much about photography. And I mean, New Orleans was this amazing place uh, to, to be doing photos. Um, in the summer times, summertime, I would take some classes and then I ended up a teaching assistant and then, you know, teaching classes at the main photo workshops. And uh, I mean, I worked with Sally Mann and Bruce Davidson, um, Eugene wow. Richards, like these incredible people. Yeah. And so then it was after that, those experiences that I decided I wanted to um, apply to graduate school in photo. So, um, you know, I, I made a portfolio, applied to Yale, um, because, mainly because my family was here. And, uh, and that's where I went. And, it, and Yale was a great, I mean, it was a great program. Um, and it was within a, you know, a university where I could access all kinds of things. So it, it was good for me. Yeah. I'm curious, you were, it, it seems like after that, you started to kind of photograph, uh, you said the planet and the world, you know, uh, yes. the, the land, you know, and, yes. and um, uh, what, what draw you, 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 your focus is on the fault lines. It's on these, on these places. Boundaries. Where, uh, I like yeah, boundaries. boundaries. Yeah, 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 there you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, breaking boundaries. That's what we're doing. Uh, but uh, no, it's, uh, um, you were focused on the, the boundaries, the fault lines. What, what drew you to those? What, why were you photographing those? I don't think we're going to get a chance to look at those uh, series in yeah. this one. But, but I'm kind of curious because um, this is kind of leads you into where you're going. Yes. So, well, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, I also have a degree. I'm, in, I'm psychotherapist. Um, and I was... Once I graduated with my MFA, I, I was able to take to go to school for um, for free, this one university. And I started taking some classes in psychology and, you know, one class led to another and I ended up graduating. Um, but one one thing that really st stuck with me was this idea of boundaries and like boundaries within families, like what, what's a healthy boundary? What does it mean when you trespass boundaries? So I started taking that kind of psychological concept and applying it to the land. And I reconceptualized like where I grew up, um, like the river where I grew up 
created, it was a geologic fact. You know, I was in the, that valley with the river that made it possible for these industries to set up there and, you know, kind of dump their space, their, their waste into the river. Um, and we saw that all around, you know, um, at that time, like these manufacturing valleys, they were always in a valley. So I, I, I kind of thought, you know, the, the land itself creates boundaries and, you know, and then the cultural side of that, us as people, you know, we, we utilize that geologic reality for our purposes. Um, so that's kind of how I started thinking about boundaries upon the land and geologic boundaries in particular. Um, the first real in-depth series that I did was in the Everglades. And I, I got a Guggenheim to do this. It was, um, you know, I, I spent a year plus, really two years working in the Everglades. And I was interested in, in how um, Everglades National Park seems so wild and, you know, um, I mean, there are mangroves, there are alligators, there are crocodiles, it's, you know, there are grasslands, that, there's so much there. Um, you go in there, it's dark, you know, it's, it's like all those artificial lights go away and you can see the stars. And, um, you know, but I realized that the, the park itself is a park because it's a living museum. People have created a boundary around this wild lands and created a living museum. And it's there because we, we make it there now, you know, we protect it. Um, outside of that park boundary, where it used to be Everglades wild lands, um, you know, it's, it's been, um, the water's been drained out. Um, the swamp has been reclaimed to be, you know, sugarcane fields and developing, um, um, you know, housing, real estate. So, you know, I was interested in like what happens in, in today's world. And this was back in 2002 that I did this. And in the world today, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers created that, you know, like re moved the land around, drained the swamp to create something that wasn't there. And I thought, wow, you know, it was kind of depressing. I mean, they, you know, it's in Florida has so many issues now, partly because of that. Um, I thought, where might there be a geologic boundary upon the land that we can't control, that people can't control, contain? It's not um, related to like economic interests or national, um, you know, boundaries. And so I came, I <laughs> came to tectonic plates that they're like these completely wild, you know, geologic phenomenon that happens that, you know, people may live upon the plate, but we can't, we can't even predict when there's going to be a, an earthquake, you know, despite many efforts. Um, so um, I ended up foc focusing on, you know, the two land-based edges of the North American tectonic plate, in part because I live, you know, on that plate. So anyways, that's how it happened. <laughs> kind yeah, of roundabout. Yeah. So so yeah. that that kind of approach when you were doing that work. Now I, I think the work that you're doing now is a little bit more conceptual, a little bit more yes. abstract, I would I would say. But but like during those days, uh, what was your work like? What how were you going about photography in that time? I used a four by five. Um hmm. And uh, I remember I traditionally was uh, photographing black and white. And I remember when I was in the Everglades, I think it was actually around 2004, I asked one of my former teachers, I said, you know, I think I, think I might want to switch to color. And he said, well, you know, the best way to do that, you know, you're using a four by five, put one sheet of black and white um, in the holder and the other side of the holder, because the holder holds two sheets of, you know, yeah. sheet film, um, <clears throat> put a sheet of color film and then just photograph the same scene, you know, one black and white, one color. So that's what I did towards the, you know, the end of photographing in the, in the Everglades. 
Um, and at that time, it was also like a real shift between, um, you know, do I then do I print them like C prints or do I scan them and print them, you know, inkjet prints? Um, so I started with the C prints, but then, you know, eventually went to inkjet, of course. And, you know, but it was like this kind of real technological shift that was happening about the time that I um, started using color. So yeah. the Rift Fault, which is uh, the project with the tectonic plates, I uh, photographed in color and, uh, and it was film. Um, I didn't start using digital until, I don't know, 2012, 2014, something like that. I'm kind of curious too, is um, uh, you were talking about Jackson Hill. Um, that was uh, yes. a, a very big moment for you. Was there anybody else that was key in your developing as a, as a photographer that kind of helped you out in this process? Uh, anybody that was really, really important for you? Well, um, my undergraduate teacher, John Wood, was a big influence. Um, and I would say partly it was because of John Wood that I became a photographer. Uh, you know, he taught photo and printmaking um, at Alfred University. And I... Um, I really loved, he, he was kind of like part of that new Bauhaus that, you know, um, that was kind of centered in around Chicago. And um, so John like broke a lot of rules of photography. Like he primarily made collage and uh, photo collage with drawing. Um, he was political, like way back then he was um, like a real, um, activist in his work regarding the environment, gun control. Um, he, you know, always advocated for animals and birds. So, but in a totally non-dogmatic way, like really these incredible collages. I mean, I would cur encourage everybody to look at his work. Um, but John, um, John was a huge influence. And I remember you know, we, we kind of stayed in touch over the years. And I remember at one point, I don't remember what year it was, but I was in a show at the Corcoran Museum of Art in Washington, D.C. And I went to the opening and I saw my work hung in this museum show right next to John Woods. And they you know, the music, the curators did not know our connection or anything. And John Wood was also there. And I just thought, Oh my God, that's just so amazing that, you know, I am, I am in his company in this museum. And, uh, so it, he was very significant. Um, and he kind of taught me that you can make visual poetry. That's about, you know, something that you're passionate about, that you care about. And that's the biggest thing. I forgot to say I teach, but I, I teach my students. I said, what, what is your passion? What do you care about in the world? You know, your, your work, you know, be, becoming an artist is more than, um, you know, becoming um, proficient in your medium. It's like, what, what do you want to, what do you want to say with your work? You know, what, what is it about? And so John, like really taught me at a very early age that you can, you can make visual poetry about important things in the world that, um, you know, that's, that still retains such beauty. And, and then I would go from him to um, um, Robert Adams, who I never met, but was so instrumental to me. Um, especially like I learned about him when I was at Yale and, uh, and Yale actually holds a lot of his, um, his archives and his, you know, they have a whole collection of his work that, you know, I've been so lucky enough to go see in person, but um, Robert Adams is an incredible writer as and photographer. And he's been able to, you know, write about photography. Um, 
his one one of his recent books is Art Can Help. It's great. But um, I remember Robert Adams talking about you can be in a in a landscape that you know, that is kind of disturbing and upsetting. And, and he was talking specifically about um, Clear Cut Forest, where he lives in Oregon. And he did a whole series in a book about that clear cut place. And um, he says, you know, it's, it's distressing to come here and photograph. But once you start looking through the viewfinder and you start composing the pictures and you start seeing the light, because photography is so much about light. And he said, you yeah. kind of you kind of become, you surpass that, you know, the fact of the thing. And you're making photographs, you're making pictures that have to do with light. And so I've always like kind of taken that to heart. Um, so I would say John Wood and, and Robert Adams and, you know, many more, but they, in terms of photographing the land, they, they've been very instrumental to me. You said something, uh, you said the surpass the fact of the thing. Is it, Did I get that right? Maybe, yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, it does. I, I just want to see how that, that kind of manifested for you. What it, it, You know, you're taking yeah. that, it, it was really impactful for you. So how did that translate into what you do? I, so, I love that. <laughs> I'm just like, well, there's like one thing I love so much about photography is that there's yeah. this, like there's, there's an indexical relationship to the world. You know, you have, you need to have a reference in front of the lens for lens based work, which is what I do. And, um, you know, and, and so I love, I love like being in, in the actual world and, you know, taking my camera out of the studio and um, photographing some place or something that's in front of the lens. You know, photography is subtractive. So you're, there's that whole expanse of the world and you're kind of editing down into that rectangle. But then when you're composing and this most often, I mean, I felt this so much when I was using the view camera, you know, you're, you're looking in you know, this, this upside down image on the ground glass, upside down reversed image. That's kind of faint. You have a dark cloth over your head. So you're kind of removing yourself from, you know, seeing with your eyes, actual world. And you're seeing, you know, this, this other kind of representation. And at that point, it kind of, you know, you've always, I, I, like if I were to go out with a four by five, I would have a little camera, like a, a Mamiya, let's say Mamiya 7, that I would kind of look through the lens and, and compose. And then when I'd see something that I wanted to photograph, you know, I'd set up the view camera and, um, and then do the, you know, the final kind of work looking on the ground glass. So you're removed from the world and it becomes abstracted and you're, and, and, you know, like I'm looking at the light, I'm looking at the composition, the edges of the frame, um, you know, and, and just kind of composing in that way. And, and there's something kind of ecstatic about that, you know, that the structural experience of making a photograph, which is not the thing itself. You know, I'm making, composing something that's going to become like a latent image, you know, it's and I love that idea too. This kind of invisible trace of the real um, that manifests later. So I, I think that's what I what I was referring to when I said that. I think that also leads me into like this first body of work that was in Urbanautica, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh, it was a part of the Urbanautica Awards, and uh, I know uh, it's called Lost Lake, and you took a, a, a different approach. So talk to me a little bit about that, and then we're going to take a look. Okay. So Lost Lake um, kind of started during the pandemic when, you know, I couldn't travel and go places. Um it was primarily made in the, like the, there's open space with trails, protected land trust, 
um, across the street from where I live. So I would go in there and walk with my camera. And at the time, um, so I live with my, uh, my two um, twin grandchildren live with me. And they moved in around the time of the pandemic uh, with my daughter. And they were maybe three then. And my granddaughter uh, is blind. So I would take both of them into the forest with me, We'd go for a walk. And, um, you know, and I would wonder what Isabella, how she experienced the forest. What is it like if you're vision impaired? You can't see, you can't, um, and she really doesn't see much, you know, maybe some bright light or um, little patches of vision, perhaps if the eye is at the right angle at the right moment of time when there's light. Um, and so I just thought, what is her, what is her experience of the forest? And it just occupied me and it grew and grew. I became kind of obsessed with it. Um, I started looking at archives from the uh, Perkins School for the Blind, and they have these, you know, all of the historic records of how, um, you know, children were taught how to experience the world um, through kind of raised, you know, um, embossed paper. And so, um, so I started just manipulating my photographs. At first I put like some colored gels because I was also teaching her um, on my light table. You know, I had these colored gels that I would work with photography. So I put the colored gels on the light table in this bright light and she would look at the colors and I was teaching her the colors and she could see them. She put her at that point, she could, she's lost more vision, but she could put her eyes like a right close to the, the light table and see the colors. So I'm like, what color is that? And she did learn her colors. And um, so then, you know, I started photographing in the forest by bringing the, some of those photographic gels with me, putting them over the lens. Um, but it was a little bit hard to do that. And eventually I, I ended up putting some color fields um, in Photoshop post-production. Um, but I also started like um, manipulating, like kind of um, intentionally glitching some of the photographs um, because I, I know that her retinas are kind of, they detach and they're kind of folded. And so if she's experiencing anything, it's like a, a distorted perspective um, because the, the way the retinas are. And so I just, you know, I, it really influenced me. And I have to say, you know, I, I wouldn't even show some of the work now <laughs> because it got, you know, it was really kind of, I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I was exploring <laughs> this, it was a very kind of, you know, I was wondering what her world was like. Um, but, yeah. but I did. We had so much you know, time. We had so much time in, yes. in 2020 to, to kind of do a lot of that stuff. So there's exactly. a, a lot so of really interesting, it. exactly. A lot of exploration. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting, uh, very thoughtful topic. And it's, uh, you know, it, I was taught by a great teacher, you know, it says, put yourself in someone else's shoes and, and you can kind of see yourself trying to do that. Uh, I, yes. I hadn't heard that, that story about uh, teaching her the colors with the color gel. Yeah. That is just uh, it's such a cool story. Yes. No, no. Yeah. And uh, well, and it also, <laughs> it also makes sense for uh, with some of the images and how you were kind of, uh, kind of going in those directions. Uh, what, yeah, why the, it really does. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, why I was the, just going to say, I, I totally forgot about that link. You know, we had a, yeah we had this teacher coming to the house, uh, like a, like a blind teacher. And she brought a really like a light table for her with like, um, some s small color gels and some other like faces and stuff that you could put on that were on. So I'm like, this is, this is not very effective. So I just started using my light table and my big color gels and, um, 
you know, yeah. So I did that, like all that during the pandemic, I was doing that. That's so cool. Uh, why the why the title Lost Lake? Why Lost so, Lake? So um, Lost Lake is an actual lake that oh, okay. I mean, it's a it's a, a tidal water lake. It's brackish. Um, it's related to you know it's kind of near the Sound Long Island Sound, and so it's it's an actual place. And I loved. I always kind of wanted to do something that with Lost Lake. Um, but I, and this seemed like a perfect time to do it because there was so much loss. I mean, I was also experiencing, you know, that, I mean, it's ongoing. I still experience, you know, the, the fact that she has no vision, you know, I mean, that's, it's like unbelievable. Sometimes I just can't, still can't grasp it. But there was, it was during the pandemic, you know, we lost so much, we lost people, we lost contact with each other. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm very, I mean, to me, the, the issue of our time is climate change. And, you know, we were losing trees in the forest, like, oh, so many trees, like during the pandemic, we had a little um, tornado that that came through here and a spinoff from the tornado literally went in my backyard. It's, I watched it go through my backyard, then back into the forest. And you could see the trail of the trees that, that, that became uprooted. Um, and so I, can I read you uh, Susan Stewart's that excerpt from the poem? Of course. Of course. And so I read this, um, I love the poetry of Su Susan Stewart, and she has a book called The Forest. And this, like, to me, like, um, says so much about how I was experiencing the forest at that time. I'm going to just read you a little bit of it. So it's called The Forest. You should lie down now and remember the forest, for it is disappearing. No, the truth is it is gone now. And so what details you can bring back might have a kind of life. Not the one you would hope for, but a life. You should lie down now and remember the forest. Nonetheless, you might call it in the forest. No, the truth is it is gone now. Starting somewhere near the beginning, that edge. So, you know, she also like references the edge and so what is the edge is it the edge of remembrance you know the the edge of of um is there a, a time when it changed you know so uh yeah that's important you know that you also have important. that receding edge of progress on the forest you know what they call progress you know yes and how it just yeah. recedes back and i the other the other thing that stands out to me is lay down uh, yes. Lay down and remember. Yes. Uh, I think that's interesting. Yeah. What do you think that means to you? Well, it means that, you know, you have to make an effort mm. to remember that you have to lay down and close your eyes and, you know, try to try to go back and remember. Mm. I think we've and, done a really you know, good job. I think we've done a really good job setting up this series. So, <laughs> should I share <laughs> the screen? Yeah, let's take a look. Let's uh, okay. let's jump into some of the images. I don't know if you can see here, but there's like this image is slightly, you know, uh, glitched. Um, yeah, and you know, it's it's kind of like a, a double exposure um, that doesn't totally match up. And this like is register. of the actual Lost Lake. So color fields, um, you know, I ended up using images that um, kind of over and over again in different um, reiterations. And like I have this image also in a double exposure that's a little bit more shaky. Um, this is just very monochromatic. The idea of touching the earth, 
um, became really important to me. The earth itself um, is literally in our hands. You know, like if we think back to what I said about the Everglades, like it's, you know, we, we hold the power. Um, and so there's that aspect of touching the earth, but also for blind people, um, you know, touching the earth is how they see. Uh, you know, like when I'm with my granddaughter, she, and we, she loves people. She'll like go up to a person and just take their hands and her little fingers are touching everything. And it's like, I, you know, I say she sees with her hands. People don't quite know what to make of it. I think it's great. What do you mean by this, this word glitch? It's come up a couple of times. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm losing, using it in a very, um, a broad term um, that, you know, there's the unintentional glitches that, you know, happen with digital media, um, you know, video, photographic images where the computer kind of just, you know, doesn't behave and you get some visual remnant from that. Um, I, I like deliberately would kind of glitch the image um, to make it like, this is a double exposure as well. Um, and, you know, to kind of make it so it's, it's not what the eye sees no, under normal circumstances. I, I paid special attention here to um, the fallen trees. To go back the, to, to go back to that reflection on losing trees, the lost and, and exactly. Got you. And the, and it's in the, it's in the forest. You see all of these fallen trees. It's, it's kind of remarkable. Um, and also the glacial erratic I'm, I'm fascinated with, we have a lot of erratics here, um, stones that kind of were dropped at a long time ago from, you know, um, moving glaciers and they don't really belong. They're not, they're not native to the bedrock. So, you know, in contrast to the seemingly, you know, always moving trees of the forest, these stones are so solid and heavy. Uh, so I, I'm incorporating the, the stones as well. I love the gradient on this one. Yeah. Yeah. And so you feel like this is, uh, uh, do you, this kind of interpretation is, why did you do that? Were, were you just trying to get closer? No, no, just in general, just the, the whole project is, is an effort um, to kind of imagine what she's, were you trying to do this in a, was it kind of yeah. like a, a tribute or is it just trying to get closer to her? Or, uh, what were you? It, I was just trying to like figure out how at first it, I just was like, how does she experience the world? How, how does she experience the forest? Cause that was our main activity <laughs> during the pandemic. Yeah. You know, you couldn't really go anywhere. Um, so we, you know, would go on these walks cause it, they were close, the trails, and um, it was, it became, I guess it became part of my obsession to imagine what, what her reality is like. And then, of course, it just took on a life of its own. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, she's not really interested in the forest anymore. I mean, she likes walking there sometimes, but it's not the same as like coming like these daily walks. Um, and I, you know, she prompted the series, but it's not necessarily so much about her anymore, about me imagining what she may be experiencing. Um, I kind of feel like I've, I've created a, a visual language that's my own. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's this shakiness, like of this one, another double exposure that's kind of shaky, you know, and it's, 
it's like, I, I do feel like we're on shaky ground, you know, like literally like photographing on the edges of, of the tectonic plate. You know, we don't know when an earthquake is going to occur. We have a little bit more sense of volcanic eruptions, but sometimes they surprise us. Um, you know, but there's like this un, unpredictable kind of scary sense of the world right now that I feel. Um, and I think many people feel it's, it's an unsettled state. And I especially actually like this one because the, those, you know, the stones themselves are shaking, um, yeah. which will happen in like an earthquake. Um, but I, I just think we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, to your we previous, live in, yeah. yeah, we live in this like kind of unsettled space. That's true. And, you know, and I, I use the word liminal space. Um, I, I've used that word to describe that, that kind of place where I like to photograph. Like I like the boundaries, but along the boundary itself is it exists something that's a little more liminal. There's the inside the boundary and outside of the boundary. And you know, you're either in, let's say, for example, you're in the park or you're not, you know, um, but right along that edge, is a place that's a little bit uncertain. Um, and so I kind of think of this project as being there, um, but it's also my homelands. You know, this is, this is like kind of in my backyard, so to speak. And uh, so it's, it's like something I'm very familiar with and I can, you know, I go visit all the time, I see subtle differences. So how has this uh, project uh, made itself into the world? Do, do you do books or have you done installations? Uh, how, how do you I, imagine this? Yeah, I, I have had um, an installation of this work, actually two. Here's the hand touching the earth again. Yeah, um, and the, you know, the... Um, the images are different sizes. The hands, I, I don't like to print larger than life size. Um, and, you know, something like this, like this is larger. It's, it's a composite image. Um, so it's a big file. And, um, you know, so this could be about 40 by 50. Um, but they range in scale. And I like the idea of things being different sizes on the wall. So as you walk through, you're experiencing more of a, um, I mean, it's a kind of a choreographed experience, like different notes, so to speak. Um, yeah. And, you know, I would like to make a book of this at some point, but it's, I'm not there yet. It's still in progress. Is this project still ongoing? Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So that's it for that one. Wonderful. Yes, it's still ongoing. Um, and I'm going to show you another body of work that I'm, I'm working with Martha Lewis on. It's a collaborative piece. Should and this is ever after, correct? ever after. So okay. I'm going to give you a quick, just a couple quick piece pieces that other piece of work that Martha and I did. Actually, let me take you first. Oops, not there. Sorry. Um, Martha Lewis and I, uh, we were both finalists for a percent for our program at the Connecticut um, agricultural experimental station. They wanted to make a permanent installation and they wanted uh, people to access their archives. It's the oldest agricultural station in the United States. And so they have, you know, these incredible photographs and records going back, you know, to the 1800s. So what you're looking at here, oh, so let me just say, Martha and I were both finalists. And we knew each other, but we had never worked together before. And when we went for the final 
for a tour of the facilities, um, we saw that we were up against um, these te two teams of architects from out of state who had very slick proposals because, you know, that's what they do. And it was the first time we had ever done something like this. Um, so I said, Martha, maybe we should collaborate <laughs> and, you know, create the final proposal together. So I talked to the state of Connecticut. They said we could do it. We did it. We won. Um, so this is part of the permanent installation and the, the wall, bespoke wallpaper that you see are, it's made of um, uh, weather records that they have been keeping since um, the 1800s. And, um, and then I made, I recontextualized photographs from their collection. This room is like the most political room that we made. Um, it's about the warming climate, um, some of the destructive practices per perhaps that, um, you know, we made in the, in the idea of progress like, you know, pesticide spraying and, um, you know, clear cut, stuff like that. Um, I'll give you just a, here's one of the climate records. Um, I love that, that you were up against two uh, yes. architecture, uh, were they firms? Teams. Teams. Or were they? They were teams. They were they from. These. They had, they were within a, a firm, so they had all of those resources that a firm yeah, would offer. Those three D renderings and yes, yeah, yes. they do all that stuff. And and so, did did you get any feedback on 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 why uh, why you two won? Um. Well, I think they really liked our proposal. I mean, yeah. you know, we really dove into the archives. Um, yeah. Like this bespoke wallpaper right here, it's all from, like they have these amazing books, you know? So Martha, you know, did this wallpaper and she just scanned all, it was during the pandemic. We would take the materials home and scan them. And, uh, you know, perhaps it would have been a slightly different if we were able to be there, you know, but we couldn't, like really be there. So we yeah. took a lot of things home and we were able to work that way. And what you can see here. Um, so I think they liked our proposal, you know, and I, yeah. they liked, they knew me, they knew mo both of us. They liked my photographs. I've gotten grants from the state of Connecticut before. Um, so, but this, like we had a lot of signage. You, you could see insect information office here. And so they found, I'm just going to tell you this story because it's funny. They found that when people brought in their um, problems, like let's say they had a leaf with um, an insect, invasive insect on it that was um, destroying their bush, they would bring that in and they, people felt uneasy talking about their problems like in an open room. So they decided to create like a doctor's office, you know, so if when you were in there, you would, you know, go into that enclosed glass space to meet with the plant expert or the insect expert. Um, and then other people would sit in these waiting chairs out in the lobby. So we had to create, we were supposed to create a lobby that was conducive to, uh, you know, waiting. Um, let's see. How was that experience? You know, you're, you're kind of, uh, a fine art. Uh, I, I, of course, a fine art photographer, you do photography projects and stuff. How was this different than what you'd done in the past? Did you like the challenge? Oh, I loved it. It was fascinating yeah? to, to be able to, I had always kind of in my other projects, I had, um, accessed archives, um, but I had never done a permanent installation like this. So the fact that I could like, you know, re-photograph the archival images, you know, and then kind of do what I wanted with them um, was just incredible. And the access we had was amazing. So like yeah. this, like kind of Siamese apple right there that you're seeing, I mean, I, I, you know, to be able to find things like that was incredible. 
Here it is. Um, so that's the, I'm going to stop here with this, sure. but that's the context of my relationship with Martha. And then, you know, we did do, during that time, we did do an installation. Um, and you could see some of the, in this work, there's some remnants of what we're doing now. You know, the idea, I made a video of, of worms and the compost. Um, we made like an earth room with video projection. Um, I mean, this looks very much like one of our collaborative pieces now. It's the hand, you know, so I've, I've brought a lot of this stuff forward um, to what we're now doing, which I'll bring you to. And so is this, and this is ever after two and on your this website? Is, this was the, yeah, this really should be one. I have to switch that okay. because this, um, this was the original collaborative work forever after that we did. So I would give Martha, uh, um, like a, a photograph that I made. It was on rice paper. So it was very delicate paper. Um, and originally most of the, the pieces that I gave her were like images that I wasn't using in, in ever after they were kind of like remnants. Right. So I gave them to Martha and, um, and she started marbling, um, on the backside of them. And she did that to kind of, um, cause I, when I was talking about glitching, like I, I like in some of those early pieces, I would like make the photograph. So it almost looked like a marbled piece. The image was gone, you know, I'm, and I'm not using those, but it, it was gone. So Martha started marbling to kind of mirror that work that I was doing on the backside of my photographs. So then we said, Oh, then when she was marbling, she had some like paint that started getting onto the front side. And I said, I said, Mar Martha, I love that. I said, what if you started like, you know, like marbling on the front side of the photograph? So then that's when we got to this, this way of working, you know, this has become a vocabulary for us. So, um, this is actually a marbled piece plus a collage so that, um, my photograph is kind of collaged onto a larger piece of paper here. And then she, um, you know, would paint and marble on that. It's almost dreamy and, and, uh, yes, yes. Psychedelic in some ways. Well, this know? one glows in the dark, so it is kind of um. psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but is, is that kind of what you're trying to go for here? What's the intention? Why, why so take it it's, this um, far? So let's see, I think I might, oh, sorry. Uh, let me get back there. Yeah. So here I, I wrote ever after is a collaborative multimedia art project by Marion Bellinger and Martha Willett Lewis. As the artists grew increasingly alarmed by the climate and ecological crisis of the planet, they began a creative undertaking in response to the urgency of the changes. Ever After is a visual lament for the seepages, shifts, losses, extinctions, and extractions made by humankind. This page uh, displays unique works on paper that consists of photographs by Marion and painting collage by Martha. So that's, that was kind of the premise. And I really see it um, as a continuation of what we were doing at the ag station. Gotcha. How big are these? So this one, uh, this one's probably a uh, I, I don't remember actually they're on the smaller side, like 1620 might be the largest. Gotcha. So they're not like full walls, they're, like big, big, no, big things. And no. they're one of a kind, and each one. These are all unique. Okay. So one thing that I'm trying to do is I want to figure out how to make 
like these unique ones larger. And, and part of it is Martha just has to get a, a larger tray to do the marbling in. Um, but I really would love to make them much larger. And I'll show you ever after the other section is one attempt to do that. So this is a quarry. This is, uh, there are two quarries here. This is a quarry um, where they're extracting uh, pink granite. Wow. The colors are amazing. This one was made um, in a, a, during a controlled burn in the Everglades. Wow. So I'm curious, uh, you know, you're, you're moving from, uh, moving into this level of abstraction, uh, with image making and making in general is, do mm -hmm. you feel like that's an important shift and, and why do you think you're making that shift? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, well, sometimes I, I get tired of it and I just, like you could see in Ever After, there are images that have not been, you know, abstracted at all. Um, and I, I really don't want to lose sight of the image itself that, you know, is like a, the straight photographic photograph image. Um, let me take you to the next one. But there is something about the, ex you know, the abstraction that, that, teeters that teeters on this that that liminal edge of still being con in control or not um you know like like there are things that are the climate change for example is it's happening at such an accelerated rate um <clears throat> just during you know the pandemic alone so many changes occurred these extreme storms like you know I mean, when we started talking, we were at the tail end of an extreme storm here. And we were wondering, am I going to lose power? Am I going to lose internet? Should we still go forward with this podcast <laughs> right now? Um, because, um, you know, we got like three inches of rain in December. This should have been snow, you know, but it's like 55 degrees um, and then last week we had a similar store where we got like two to three inches of rain and it was 55. Um, last winter we had no snow. So things are really changing, um, very quickly. And the intensity of the storms, you know, um, scientists say that, you know, warming climate holds more um, moisture. And so when you do have a storm, they can be more intense. And, yeah. you know, we're experiencing that here. I mean, they called off schools today, roads are flooded, trees are down. Um, so there's this sense of the world changing so quickly and you can't really put your finger on, on what to do because in many ways, it's still kind of abstract. Um, you read about it, but then people who are experiencing it say, you know, this is, this is kind of devastating. Um, so I think the abstraction for me is it's really fulfilling that, that niche of, um, you know, a changing being in a shifting, you know, Martha uses the word sip the slippage. You know, it's, it's like, you're not on the same firm ground. Uh, yeah. And you, it's not quite clear what's going to happen next. Yeah. So, and you use this word liminal. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you know that there's an internet thing where they talk about liminal spaces, this, this space between uh, our, our world, it's like another dimension per se. And it almost, it, you uh -huh. know, I can't help but kind of think about because it, it's unsettling. Some people say they wake up in, in a dreamlike state and no one's around and it's just them in this world. And it's this, this space between reality and reality. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, reality and not reality. And, and is this kind of where you're going with this? 
Um, I'm kind of curious. Not necessarily. I mean, I, I am very much aware that these, you know, these changes are occurring. But if you think back to like Susan Stewart's poem, when she says to lay down and remember, yeah. you know, there's like, um, there's like that level of, of remembrance. I remember in December when we had snow every Christmas, for example. Um, and, you know, now we haven't had snow in two years uh, in December. So, you know, it, it's just like a, it's a state that, that is, um, there's, it's a state that's kind of suspended in a way because we do have agency to, to kind of stop that acceleration or to slow it down. We have, a, we have agency to do that. Whether we choose to do that or not, that's, that's the question for me. Um, so there, it's, a, it's a wonderful kind of step forward. I see kind of, uh, um, I, I see the previous project in this one too. Um, mm -hmm. I see kind of this evolution with you and your visual language and, um, there, uh, you know, I, I think you're, you can easily, there's a lot of people that, that avoid the kind of the aesthetic image, you know, because it's like, sometimes people are like, they just don't see it for what it is, but, but these are just so like interesting to look at. And I, uh, and mm -hmm. I love what you're saying here and I'm, and I'm just trying to pull that out because, I think what you're doing is you're really thinking about something and uh, you're expressing yourself in such a um, unique way with it. And I love the tangible nature of it. It, it kind of reminds me of, of, of your, or your beginnings of, you know, that, that very hands-on ceramic art, you know, and mm -hmm. I can kind of see that, that kind of influence in you kind of putting these worlds together with the help uh, of another person. So, which, which leads me to my next question is what, what is it like to collaborate with another artist? So, um, Oh, let me just say one thing before I answer that. Sure. Yeah. So this is, this is actually one of the really abstracted pieces that I was making that I was saying I was making early on. Yeah. So this is kind of what it looked like. But then this has Martha's marbling on top of it. Yeah. Um, so the pieces we're looking at here um, are all like photographically done. In my quest to make larger images and, and also images that were more reproducible, I started... Um, um, doing um, montaging like Martha's Martha's marbling with my photograph, so I, I would you know photographically document her marbled piece, and then in Photoshop I would make a double exposure, <clears throat> and then um, so that's how all of these pieces were made. And you can see they don't you know they're a little more clinical feeling. They don't have the same kinds of, you know, tactileness that sure. um, that the other ones, the unique ones, had. But like this piece, you could still see along the edges. You know, there's like, um, you know, there's a border here. There's some yellow paint that that's here. Uh, there's one that's yeah. This one's folded. Um, so you you see it, but it's just not. You know, it's still a flat piece. So I just wanted to yeah. describe that. And in terms of Martha and I collaborating, um, it's been like five years since we've, since we've started to collaborate and, um, you know, starting with the ag station. And I, I think we're very, uh, we're very considerate of each other's process. Um, I trust her. And like, I'll give her a photograph and, you know, she'll crop it. And I'm like, okay, you know, 
do it. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we can both say, I don't like that. And then we process it. And if one person doesn't like it, we don't do it. Um, so we have created a relationship where it's, it's pretty easy to collaborate. Um, but you still have to have those conversations. I don't like this because, um, you know, and if it's something that you, you feel strongly about, you kind of, ha we have to, you know, negotiate. Um, you know, we, we've worked it out. I, I think it's generally a hard thing to do to collaborate with people. Artists have strong opinions and, uh, you know, and we started this just not knowing how it would turn out. You know, we have, like, it started off that we were making crunched pieces and, you know, we've moved on. There's been a whole kind of evolution to get to the point we're at now. So I think it's a wonderful collaboration and, and you, you guys are, um, you two are actually making really uh, great work together. And, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Uh, are you open to other collaborations in the future? Or do you feel like I found my collaboration partner? Um, well, this grew organically. Yeah. Um, I didn't think of collaborating. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I'm always open to things. Sure. But it's like the way this happened, it was just by chance, we were both on that tour. So we both knew we were finalists for that award. And when we saw who we were up against, we thought, I think we should team up. <laughs> um, you know, we did it and, and we really, I mean, it was years that we worked on that together. It took like three years from beginning oh, wow. to end. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of logistics. We had to deal with lawyers and, you know, legal stuff and insurance and, um, you know, it was complicated and we were able to do that. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, we, we kind of started developing our language, our collaborative language then. And, um, so it just kind of grew from there. It wasn't like, oh yes, let's collaborate. It was just like, okay, we're going to do this. We want to get this. We want to do this. Let's, you know, form a team here. So how do you, how do you see this kind of putting it, finding itself in the world? Uh, do you see this in an exhibition or a book? You, I would you had very mentioned much books. Like to have, you had yeah. mentioned books. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Uh, that direction. So I'm kind of curious to see if this would end up in a book, but they would have to be. Me scans. too. I mean, I would love for yeah. this to be a book. Um, I, yeah. I love books. I think, you know, it, I think a book would be really, really lovely. Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about um, perhaps like showing some of the, um, the archival images that I used at the ag station. Um you know, we, we still have full access of, to their archives and their library. Um, if we were to have an exhibition, our thought is that we would also incorporate, like I would have some of the Braille images that I was talking about from the Perkins School from the Blind. Um, and then, um, then we would also have some of the, you know, historic archive images from the Ag Station, maybe the insects eating the leaves, um, things like that, you know, that would be on the wall in between some of the other things. That, that leads me to a, a good question is, um, uh, how important is research to you? Is that, is that a big part of what you do? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's such an important part of my process and I, I love it. Um, you know, going back to like what I, I tell my students, like discover what you're passionate about and then dive in, read about it, you know, um, look at it, what movies have influenced you. Like I absolutely adore Herzog's movies, <laughs> you know, um, Fitzcarraldo is like one of my favorites. Um, and you know, just like what movies do you watch? What 
books do you read and all of that and what music? I mean, I think it all kind of like is woven together. If you, and some people don't know what they're passionate about. It's like, okay, you have to discover that. That's the first thing. And partly you discover it by going out and making photographs, but also um, you read and research it. So, um, so the Everglades, it was like, I did so much research for the Everglades and also the San Andreas Fault, you know, and the mid-Atlantic like tectonic plates. I learned about geology. I didn't know about tectonic plates. Um, and, you know, I just want to mention this idea about tectonic plates. That did not become scientifically um, accepted as a concept until the 60s. And, you know, um, and then I think of like the struggles we have had uh, for people to accept that climate change is real. And, you know, it just takes, it's like these, these ideas arise from evidence, some kind of evidence. And then, you know, but for the general public to embrace it, or even, you know, scientists themselves to embrace it, um, it, you know, it can take a while. So anyways, research is so important. And I love, I love reading. I get a lot of my ideas from reading. Um, yeah. you know, Susan Orleans, um, the orchid thief, which is a book that she wrote about, um, being in the Everglades and, you know, the searching for this, like the ghost orchid, um, this very elusive orchid, you know, just really imprinted itself upon me when I was photographing there. Um, and to the point where I wrote to Susan Orlean, the author, she was a New Yorker writer and I sent her a letter via the New Yorker asking if she would be interested in writing um, the essay to my book. And so she got it like quite a bit of time later. I think she was out on maternity leave, something like that. And she wrote back and she said, yes, you know, and I, so I, I had like a writer that I was so um, excited about um, that, you know, that to write for my book. So um, I think, you know, I, I kind of latch on to certain writers when I'm researching, sure. but I also will look at the natural history. I'll look at the evolution of the land there. Um, and then I form this idea if I've never been there before, I'll form an idea of what I'm going to photograph, <clears throat> you know, make a list of things that I want to go photograph. And then whether it's like fulfilling or not, visually for me when I get there is another story, <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> it's very different. Um, yeah. but you know, that's, yeah, research is very important. Like I've always looked at the archives, you know, from like, you know, that first big thing I did in the Everglades, they have a museum with archives and I spent time in it. It's kind of set up a certain pattern for me. I love it. And you can tell in your work that you actually, you, you, you have a real connection to what it is that you're, you're working on. And, um, you can see your research come through mm -hmm. and, uh, this idea of the long game, I think came up in our previous conversation that we yes. had that, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, you have a couple of projects that are still ongoing. And so that yes. the fact of an ongoing project is, is such a, foreign concept to some people because we're we're in this world where we have to do things everything's so fast and mm -hmm. you've got to you've got to produce now and and uh i've got to do a series in just two months or whatever yes. but talk to me about the importance of of the long game what, what have you seen any benefits to that and is there anything that like has come out of that for you that that slow approach and how that kind of made a project mm -hmm. better um I think, I don't know. I mean, I look at people who don't always like, well, don't work in such a long way <laughs> and yeah. their work looks incredible. <laughs> so um, I don't want to make any, you know, generalizations about that. Um, I tend to work 
in a long way. I'd like to go back to the same place over time. Um, there are always changes that, that occur. Um, I, there's this one town in Iceland that I photographed at and, um, it changed during the time that I, it may be 2006 to when was the last time I went 2011, maybe, um, no, I went recently. I went 2018. I can't tell you each time I went back to Iceland to this one particular town, it had radically changed because of um, earthquakes, eruptions, you know, mm -hmm. so it's right on the fault line. And so land would collapse. Um, a new land mass would arise. Um, hot lava would come t to the surface. And, you know, it was just like unbelievable. Uh, and I don't know, I, same thing with the Everglades, because it's an act, they're actively trying to restore the Everglades right now. It's at a snail's pace, but they're trying to do it. Things are different every time I go there. Um, and I just, I don't know, part of it is just being really curious, yeah. I think. And that land does change. And, you know, if, if, Perhaps if one is living there, you don't see the change because it happens over time. Yeah. But I like this idea of, you know, the slow idea of geologic time versus, you know, the human scale that is really a blink of, of an eye in, you know, geologic time. Um, and so when I think of like the, the rocks, you know, they seem like, they're embedded, but, but not always, yeah. or, you know, I really, if you think of melting icebergs, that's, that's happening. <laughs> that's, we always had icebergs, you know, in the Arctic. Um, so that's changing. And I don't know. I, I, I just, so uh, it's witnessing change is the big benefit to you. I it's, think so. Especially... Witnessing change and getting to know a place. Yeah. yeah. So especially when you're focused on the land and the the land yes. is your subject and right. uh, taking your time with it because it moves slower than we do. And I love what you say, human scale, uh, mm -hmm. human scale. Um, that is <laughs> a uh, especially in relation to time. You know, we 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 have such a, a, a different way of looking at things. But if you look at it on the planet scale and earth and land and uh, we're yes. just a blip. We're just a blip. Yeah. And so taking your time with projects like that, that's, that's uh, really, really good. It's you know, just I just have one. Me. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go. Just partly. I was just going to say, it's yeah. also just me. I'm like, I'm, I work slowly and, you know, yeah. a lot of these places, if I have to travel, it's like dependent on when I can get there. Um, you know, if I can get, funding to go. So there's also that aspect of it. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I've loved our time together today. And, and uh, I just have one final question for you. And mm -hmm. it's, and it's one that I ask everybody, which is, do you have any uh, advice for upcoming artists and, and uh, image makers um, in uh, that are coming up today? And um, so I've, I've noticed a few trends, uh, students or young people, um, look at their phones, um, to, for an experience of art and, um, you know, the phone cannot replace the experience of actually going to a museum or going to a gallery and experiencing, you know, an actual photograph that's different from pixels on a screen. And you don't have a sense of scale. Like when we were just looking at my photographs, you, you have no idea. They're all kind of like, they look the same, but they're different sizes and, you know, um, they have different textures. Uh, and they, it creates a different experience when you can see that in person. Um, students also 
look to Instagram um, for an experience of art. And while Instagram is a, it's a great tool for people to post things and, you know, have generate interest. Um, it's not like if you find somebody who you, whose work you really like in Instagram, go to, I mean, they don't even go to their websites anymore. They just go to Instagram, go to their websites, see if there's a show, go under news. Is there an exhibition somewhere where you can see this work? Do they have a book? If there's a book, go to the library, look at the book. Um, so, you know, I just think that the experience of, of um, the kind of the tangible is starting to slide. And, you know, we see it, you know, people have photo albums on their phone versus a, you know, a photo album that's a real thing with, uh, that you hold in your hands and you turn the pages. Um, and I, I think those experiences are really, really important um, for a young artist. So, so do that. <laughs> Look at the books. Get out Access. There. I yeah. always bring my, I always bring the students the first day we go to the library. Many of them have not been to the photo section in the library or the art se section go to the library and make them bring, you know, check out a book. They're going to talk about the next class. Um, and they say, wow, there are so many books here. Yes. And they're incredible <laughs> books. You know, in the book, you, you get to see how an artist sequenced the work. And, yeah. um, you know, it's just really um, a gift. So even the way they choose to uh, print the colors and, and, exactly. and so on. So your advice is is get out there, be amongst it, stand in front of it. There is this um, great philosopher who wrote about this, art uh, critic and philosopher, and he talks about the aura of a piece. There's, there's, mm -hmm. and he was, it was arguing against the advent of photography. Like a photograph of a piece of art is not the same as standing in front of it, and. Mm -hmm. um, that is a great point because there is something magical uh, about standing in front of a piece. I, I, uh, I get to thinking about um, your work, especially um, Lost Lake, and you were talking about some of those images being very large in scale, and you're you're intentionally trying to immerse yeah. someone, and uh, mm -hmm. it almost like fill up their entire field of vision um, yes. just by just by one piece, and that's not something that you can get on a phone. So I, I think that's great. Uh, what else would you say um, about uh, picking your subject? Is it, is it just well, find something that you just obsessed also with? Also the is that, idea is that kind of, what else of you would do? Um, your passion. You know, what do you care about? What do you care about in the world? And yeah. uh, I think, you know, that's, that's something that, um, that, all artists have to contend with and art becomes really difficult when you don't know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. You know, in terms that I think that's when people get stuck. Um, so if you, if you have something that you're interested in and if people are stuck, you know, just go out and make photographs and look at books, identify artists who, who, you know, uh, you respond to where there's a spark and what, why do you respond to that work? Um, what yeah. is it about that work? Can you, can you go ahead and, and make a piece that's like kind of copy that piece that you're looking at? Um, artists always have gone into museums and sketched um, what they see, other pieces. So, you know, look, look to the, look at art and figure out what art you, you respond to. And then, um, and then figure out why. I think that's a good place to to maybe end it. Yeah, I think that's uh, I, th I think that's great. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the wonderful yeah. conversation. Yeah, it is. It was great. I, even the first one, uh, it was was awesome. I'm glad we got to do it again. And yes. uh, we had some technical <laughs> issues. You know, I, yeah. I guess the. We had an earthquake of technology, no pun intended, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so how can, uh, people find you? Is it, is it directly through your website? Do you have any socials, uh, share with us how we can, uh, how we can connect? Yeah. With you. So, um, you could, um, Marion Bellinger, um, dot com is my website and, um, I'm on Instagram at Bellinger studio. Um, I guess those are the two main, main ways. Um, and you could always contact me through the website or send me an image, a message, you know, Instagram. Thank you again. So, uh, as I think this podcast is a wonderful thing. So good luck with it. And <laughs> Thank I'm, you so much. I'm honored to be a part of it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. It's All been right. uh, one great journey. So to everyone that has uh, followed along this long, uh, please consider liking, sharing, and commenting down below, as well as consider uh, being a part of our Patreon channel. That's uh, uh, patreon.com and becoming a member with us there. That's how you can support content like this. And as always, we'll see you next time.